Hi, another story from the lockdown series, we call it. I'd like to thank everybody for the nice comments about that, the last one on the housing. And some people are wondering where did I get my information from. Well, what I'm doing is, for many years, I've been collecting uh, historical sources and that. Uh, my intention was to do a book, uh, A Social History of Waterford, from 1800 right up to 1970. And uh, so hopefully sometime I'll get it published. I have a huge amount of stuff. But this is very relevant to the current situation in the world today. And it's about a period in Ireland from 1799 up to uh, the time of the famine. And there were several epidemics that hit. You had cholera, you had fever, you had dysentery. And all those killed thousands and thousands of people, not only in Ireland, but in Waterford. Now, I'm going to have to paraphrase some of it because it's written in a language that, uh, even though it's English, it's 19th century English and it's somewhat different. It's very, very kind of fancy language. And uh, the Fever Hospital, which I'll be talking about a lot in Waterford, uh, was built in 1799. It was the first fever hospital in Ireland and the second in the whole of the United Kingdom. The one in London was the only one before that. And so we have a lot of... Now you'll also hear mention of the Leper Hospital. The Leper Hospital was built in 1784 and it eventually became what we would have known as the infirmary. So these are the things you'll hear about. So uh, thank you very much to my sister who taught me to slow down when you're talking. Sometimes I talk too fast. Sometimes when you're passionate about a subject, you're inclined to get all caught up. So I apologise if I spoke too fast. Anybody looking for any information again, uh, for it, uh, just put it up on, on Facebook and I'll answer them. So here we go. This is a fever in Waterford from 1799 to, uh, we say, 1849, up to the time of the famine. Allow me to just have a little sup of my coffee here and away we go. Now again, as I say, I'm going to have to paraphrase some of this because of the language. And again, there's lots and lots of figures in it, so I'm going to round the figures off, uh, which was another um, suggestion was made to me. So here we go. In 1799 to 1800, the poor of Waterford had epidemic among them. They had fever, dysentery, as well as smallpox. Now I think we all know what smallpox is. And fever is essentially what's fever, high temperature. What is dysentery? Well, dysentery is, it's the same, we know it as diarrhea, but it's different insofar as diarrhea is just going to the toilet constantly in a watery substance. Dysentery is an inflammation of the colon and the, the passing, the stools as we call it, is usually accompanied by blood and it could have been deadly. In 1817, 1818, Waterford was again struck by an epidemic. It began with dysentery and ended with the same in the autumn of 1818. On July the 1st, 1832, there was an outbreak of cholera in Waterford. Now the deaths from that 1832 outbreak of cholera in Ireland was far greater than in England. In England, the whole number of cases of cholera is reported to be 50,000 and the number of deaths almost I should have said 50,000 and the number of deaths 15,000. In London there were 11,000 cases of which uh, 5,500 were fatal. In Wales there was 1,500 cases of which 500 was fatal. In Ireland from its first interruption or eruption in 1832 to March 1833 there had occurred 54,500 cases of cholera of which 21,000 were fatal. A lot of people. The Waterford Fever Hospital and House of Recovery reduced the amount of deaths dramatically. In a statement respecting the House of Recovery at Waterford for the year 1800, that's more or less the time it was founded, it is calculated that in one year and five months after its establishment, there was a reduction in the number of fevers amounting to nearly 1,300 and that about one in 20 only died in the house. Between the 19th of August 1799 and the 1st of February 1803, being a period of three and a half years, 1,773 fever patients in Waterford were rescued uh, from the disease and death and restored to the blessings of health and industry. The number of patients admitted, admitted 
from the opening of the Fever Hospital in the year 1799 to the 1st of March 1819, 10 year period, was 10,018. Up to the 1st of March 1818 were 6,500, about 348, excuse, 350 per year. In the last year, above nine times the average. The same report gives a fascinating glimpse into the fever hospital when it describes the conditions inside the hospital. Now this is 1799 and this is amazing. This is the leper hospital which was subsequently uh, demolished. It could have been the, the 1950s or early 1960s when it was demolished. Uh, a house was, uh, was built there afterwards. They are at present, this is 1799, 159 beds laid out in the hospital and the wards of the Leffer Hospital which are appropriated to fever patients. So that means they use both the fever hospital and the leper hospital, I said, which we would have known as the infirmary for, for fee at times of fever. 93 of the beds are iron beds. 66 are on the floors of the ward. That means they don't have any legs, they're laid on the floor and 44 patients obliged to lie double. That means there was two people lying together in every bed, in 44 of the beds. 17 of the nurses and servants of the house have been attacked with the fever within the last 14 months. Four of them have been attacked twice or thrice within the same period. One nurse died from fever. Now the following describes the method employed in bringing patients from the homes in Waterford City to the fever hospital just after its foundation in 1799. And it reads, whereupon the visit of the physician, that is the doctor, or the certificate of some other person uh, that was allowed to do it, they would go to the, the house of the patient. Uh, the litter is sent. Now I must explain about the litter. The litter was essentially two poles and across the poles were sacking and over that then was another little frame in which the patient would be in. So two people, one person in front, one person at the back would actually convey or bring the person from the house in this little kind of like, so like a little cubicle so to speak made up of sacking and linoleum and a covering to bring them up to the hospital. The litter consists of sacking bottom extended on a frame placed between two poles, something like those of a sedan chair, with oil covering stretched over it, and the whole painted white, that means all the wooden part obviously. The carriage is very light, easily borne by two men or women, and in it the patient is privately conveyed in a recumbent posture, so that's essentially lying down to the house, and yet not excluded from the ear, so the ear could get in around as they're bringing them up around to uh, the hospital as it has loose hanging curtains at the end, like those of the English stagecoaches. When received, this is very, very interesting, the patient is stripped of his clothing and put into a clean bed. The bedstead being entirely of iron and the ticks, that means the mattresses, filled with straw, sits down like a mattress. When these bed bedsteads are unoccupied, the bedsteads are removed from the wards and the bedsteads are hung up against the walls so not as to interfere with the washing of floors. So there was an awful lot of cleanliness going on. The wards have not only windows on each side, but also apertures in the wall level with the floor so as to supply a current of air under the beds occasionally. So there was essentially little holes in the wall underneath every bed so the air could flow in around under the bed and remove any probably dust or any type of infection. The patient's clothes when taken off are washed and purified and laid by till wanted. In the meantime the patient wears the dress of the house if a male a white woolen jacket and trousers and in the case of a female a jacket and a petticoat. Upon the removal of the patients that means when they go back out of the fever hospital it is the general practice to take the straw out of the mattress and burn it and then to have the ticking washed that means again that essentially the mattress. After this it is again stuffed with fresh straw so as to be ready when wanted. But in 1832 worse was yet to come Cholera descended in Waterford. It struck again in 1849, that's at the height of the famine. But back to 1832. On July the 1st, 1832, Waterford appear, cholera appeared in Waterford. According to the tables of death, 
in the census of 1841 in Waterford City from 1831 to 1841. 1,000 when almost 2,000 persons died from the epidemic and endemic and contagious disease alone. That's fever, cholera and whatever sort of contagious diseases uh, that happened. These included cholera and fever. The total number of deaths in Waterford City from that 10 year period from all other illnesses, that's all illnesses, uh, was 7,000. A lot of people in one year. The deaths from cholera throughout Ireland during the year of 1849 was 30,000. That's deaths in Ireland. 30,000. And although disease spread into the following year, the mortality was but, uh, the deaths were only little less than 2,000. The most marked difference existed with respect to the influence of the seasons. Well, that is, it gives a breakdown of the figures in spring and all that. But uh, compared with populations like the towns of Drogheda, Galway and Belfast, uh, the cities of Waterford, Limerick, Kilkenny and Cork suffered most. At a meeting of the Sanitary Committee in Waterford on August, in August 1849, Dr Maxey, great man, I'll tell you about him later on as a, a, another story, he reported that in Waterford City the amount of persons with cholera up to the present, now we're speaking about 1849, received into different hospitals was over 900 people, of whom 500 died. Very big mortality there. And in general throughout the cities, the deaths in Waterford in 1832, that's the previous cholera epidemic, was only 300. So in 1849, you had a famine to contend with, but the conditions of the people were probably worse than somewhat during the famine because they wouldn't have, the bodies, their health wouldn't have been built up with food. So 500 died in 1849. So the present attack, it says here, was much more malignant and of a different character. Again, here we're back here, and they're speaking about the same things we're being advised at the moment. That's uh, social exclusion and washing your hands and all that. It says the importance of hygiene or the lack of it cannot be overstressed. It would appear from the meeting of the Water for Sanitary Committee that some steps were being taken to clean some of the cottages of the poor. Now, even up to my youth, every one or two years, people would whitewash the front of their houses. And that wasn't just to make them look clean. It was to kill any form of, of infection that might be around. It was moved at a meeting that the mayor be requested to see Bishop Forden, that was the Roman Catholic Bishop of Waterford, to express the desire of the committee to provide temporary lodgings for the inhabitants who, uh, while their present dwellings are being cleaned. In the areas of Waterford during times of fever and cholera, where good hygiene was practiced, little of any of the former diseases were in evidence as the following report will demonstrate. So that means in the parts of the town that people had good homes and they didn't live in the squalid little lanes that I spoke about in the house and our 12 people in the room. Where there was good living conditions, uh, cholera and fever didn't break out as often. So I'll go back to the report. The infrequency of fever here observed among the class of society in comfort comfortable circumstances is attributable to the superior cleanliness and ventilation of their dwellings, their more frequent ablutions, that means washing, and changes of apparel, that means clothes, and seclusion from those by whom affection is most frequently communicated. Like as I said, they were in stuff together, small families, and they'd have three or four bedrooms in their houses. Little or no fever appeared among the society of Quakers, probably from the same causes operating in a higher degree. That seclusion exerts a strong preservative influence, was exemplified by facts derived from questionable authority. In the charity school of Kilotron, that's Kilotron out there where the Manor Hotel is out there, uh, there was a school out there, it was called the Kilotron Charter School. Uh, about three miles distant from Waterford, containing 56 spies, no case of fever had occurred, either during the last summer or since the time when the disease was so pre prevalent in Waterford and the immediate vicinity of the school. At the other end of the scale, in the most destitute parts of, of the city, in a part of the city named Carrageen, still there to the present day, inhabited by the poorest and most miserable classes, there were good reason for believing that 19 persons in 20 at least suffered from fever. And in Murphy's Lane, again I spoke about that in the housing one, containing 60 houses, every inhabitant had an attack of fever within the last two months. 
The great neglect of cleanliness among the lower classes, a necessary consequence of extreme poverty, was stated also as a perfect cause for the spreading of febrile contagion. That means it was just, well, it was uh, the living conditions of the poor, and as if to emphasize the importance of cleanliness, the report continues. Among the poorer classes living in apartments crowded and ill-ventilated during the night and the great part of the day, and this exposed to the effluvia proceeding from the sick, that means people getting sick, vomit all around, going to the toilet on the floor. The disease has been observed very generally to extend to all individuals of a family. Seven or eight persons from the same rooms have frequently been admitted in succession to the hospital. That would be the fever hospital. And in the upper classes of society, such extension of fever to the members of the family was rarely observed. The circumstances of the rich would account for this immunity. Their apartments are better ventilated from those of the inferior classes, and they are not as poor exposed as the poor exposed during the night when the system is probably the most susceptible to the influence of contagion. To its impression continued many hours in small rooms, ill ventilated and favouring its propagation by neglect of every kind. Cleanliness in the persons and apartments of the richer classes also contributes to their security, nor should we omit the superior dryness of their dwellings, and there is some reason for supposing that the damp air acts as a vehicle of contagion that would be in, the, in, in the, the lower class housing. It is also probable that the more liberal use of animal food among the rich classes by invigorating the system may contribute to their security. Means that the poor live solely on whatever they could find, begging potatoes out the country. Uh, meat would, for, wouldn't necessarily form any part of their diet whatsoever, whereas uh, the, the wealthier people in Waterford would have had access to fish and to meat and to vegetables. And uh, we, you would often see, uh, I think I mentioned in the one on housing, about the people out begging for food, uh, begging for potatoes out the country. That's essentially not only the farming community, the agricultural community, but the people, the poor in the cities also essentially lived on charity of whatever someone would give them. Now, what about a cure? For the fever. Well, Ireland was then as Ireland was up to my youth, and that it was religion mixed with superstition. So, what the people of Waterford had in a fight against the cholera, what was called a talisman. Uh, it was not an approval of hygiene, but religious superstition in the form of a small stick. The following is an account of a visit to Waterford in 1832 during the cholera epidemic. It illustrates the belief that the people of Waterford City had the efficacy of this talisman. And th this man wrote, We were suddenly alarmed in the middle of the night by a violent knocking on the door. And we suppose that was visited by the Terriels, that was at that time members of a secret society. But we found it was more a friendly visitation. A man breathless with haste rushed in and thrusting a little stick into the hand of a servant, prayed him to send it to the next house and this then disappeared. We now discovered that this was the kippeen, which, like the fiery cross, was sped from house to house and was used as a, spe a specific against the cholera. It was a small piece of wood burdened on one side and quenched in a font of holy water. It was sent indiscriminately to people of all re religious persuasions, and no one who received it at any hour of the day or night delayed a moment to forward it to a neighbour as a certain and only mode of staying the pestilence. So that's all they had. We found the next day, so the man wrote, that so universal had been the circulation of the kippeen, and so numerous were the messengers that 20 shillings, a lot of money at the time, had been received in half pences at the toll house on the bridge. The bridge at that time was an old wooden bridge, and it was the toll house. You had to pay to get across. So they collected this money in a few hours by the bearers of this charm, from the persons of the County Kilkenny to the friends in County Waterford. So we were good friends at that stage, despite the hurling. The consequent debts of all those from the, the consequence of all those debts from Collar and Waterford was to be overwhelm the relatively small grounds of the city's ancient churches. Now this is part of a larger, so I stopped it there. But what that means was that the people at that stage were being buried in 
churches like St. Olaf's, uh, St. Patrick's, uh, St. Michael's, St. Stephen's, uh, Kilbarry Graveyard, Kil St. Lawrence Graveyard. And there was one reference I came across out in Kilbarry. There was no wall around the graveyard at the time and pigs were going in digging up the bodies. Uh, that was denied by the city council but it was uh, again contradicted by the person who wrote the article and said they had been out there and they had seen the pigs digging up bodies because they couldn't get that any further. The bodies were like sardines. The graves were packed full and that's the reason Balinanesia was built. So what I'll do is I think I'll, next I'll tell you why Balinanesia was built. St. Otter and Cemetery we know. Why did they build that? You're after hearing the reasons and all this why they had to build Balinanesia. Because every place else I said in Waterford, you couldn't dig, put a shovel down in a graveyard in Waterford City without digging up part of a body. And how far would the, would the shovel go down? A couple of inches. And that's how far the bodies had begun down. So they had to close all the graveyards. But I tell you what, the next story would be all about Badenonatia and the city's graveyards to show you how bad it was to be. There's nothing worse in Waterford at that time than to be a poor person. Talk to you in the next part. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget any questions, just put up it on the post and I'll answer them as best I can. Thank you.